Hello and welcome to my trip to Greece. We're going to take a look at some of the great art and architecture that you can see all around Greece dating back to ancient times. First, we're going to talk about what makes Greek architecture so special. And if there's anything that you want to remember about Greek architecture is that the Greeks sought to achieve balance and harmony of parts. And so when they did things like constructing the Parthenon, which we see here, they wanted everything to be equal and symmetrical. And harmony means things go together well. So we can see in this model here that the Parthenon definitely achieved all those things. Now, one interesting fact about these ancient Greek architecture that we're going to be looking at is that even though we think of these as sort of white marble plain structures, in ancient times they were actually painted with bright colors and filled with statues to honor the gods. We can see Greek architecture a lot in our present day world. In fact, the columns that Greeks use to construct their temples are shown throughout modern architecture. We're going to look specifically at three of what we call the Greek orders or types of columns the Greeks constructed. And they go from simplest to fanciest. And so the simplest you'll see here on the left. This is called the Doric column. The sort of middle of the road fancy are called Ionic columns, and our fanciest are called Corinthian columns. So let's take a look at these columns a little more deeply and where we might see them. We're going to start with the Doric columns. So the Doric columns we see here in our example of the Parthenon. Doric columns are the thickest and simplest of the Greek styles. They had no decoration at the base, so you can see on the sample to the left, they were pretty simple at the base. At the top, the capital, which is where the columns are decorated, were very simple. Doric columns were also tapered, which means they were wider on the bottom than they were at the top, and this helped to give the illusion of symmetry. So Doric columns, when I think of those, I tend to just think of simple. The middle of the road columns are the Ionic columns. Now, Ionic columns are sort of similar to Doric columns, but they're much thinner. <clears throat> the base at the bottom, again, was simple like the Doric column. But in an ionic column, the capital at the top was decorated with scrolls on each side. So where can we see this in today's world? In eighth grade, you're going to go on a school trip to Washington, D.C. One of the memorials that you will go and visit is the Jefferson Memorial. When you go, take a look at the ionic columns that decorate the Jefferson Memorial. This is a throwback to ancient Greece and one way that we see it in today's world. Now our fanciest of columns are the Corinthian columns. And these obviously come from the city state of Corinth. Thank you, Corinth. So Corinthian columns I think of as very fancy. One way it helps me to remember that Corinthian are the fanciest is just that Corinthian is the longest word, so it has the most to it. So of the three Greek orders or types of columns, these are the most decorative. The capital or top of the Corinthian column is decorated with scrolls and leaves. Now, these came about in the later era of Greece. So if we think of Doric, we're sort of like the first columns. Corinthians would be the last columns. If you look at the example of these ruins from the Temple of Zeus in Athens, we can see these Corinthian columns with the capitals very fancy, decorated with those scrolls and leaves, showing just how important Zeus was because the effort was made to sculpt these columns. Another, fan, another great thing about Greek architecture are these Greek theaters, and these are truly an architectural wonder. 
People have tried to recreate these theaters in recent times and just haven't been able to do this as well as the Greeks. So what was so special about these Greek theaters? Well, when you go to Greece and you take a look at these ruins of the theaters, you'll see that they were built into hillsides. And this was important. They were built into the hillsides for a reason. The shape, which was um, sort of concave, and the slope allowed voices to be heard. And so without modern technology like microphones and projection, you would be able to hear the actors speaking clearly. And it didn't matter how far away from the stage you were, voices projected quite well. It was truly an engineering marvel. Now, Greek theaters were used by the Greeks for a number of different reasons. They showed plays there, so you might go see a play from Euripides, you might go see entertainment, sporting events, or even festivals would be held at these Greek theaters. The Greek theaters would go on to later be copied and improved upon by the Romans. Now we're going to talk next about some Greek art. We're going to talk about two types of Greek art. The first is going to be Greek pottery. So Greek pottery are considered to be pieces of artwork. If you go to an art museum and you go to the ancient Greece section, you'll see lots and lots of these works of art. And these sort of evolved over time. Initially, vases were painted in black. Later, like the figure to the right, you'll see that red figures replaced the back black figures and the figures were outlined with the black. So they became a little bit fancier. A lot of these pieces of art, this Greek pottery, were painted with things like human figures, animals, and cows or gods. Often they told a story. So for example, to the left, we see a scene from the Trojan War where we see Achilles killing Paris. Um, excuse me, Paris. Over to the right, we see Medusa. And so we can see mythology being shown in this Greek pottery. Another thing that we're going to look at is we are going to look at some Greek sculpture. Now, Greek sculpture is special, and it's really special because of its accuracy. If you think about some of the art that you studied from things like ancient Egypt, you'll think about how that sculpture really wasn't designed to look like an actual person. Often faces and bodies were elongate, elongated, for example. But in Greek sculpture and art, accuracy was key. And so we look at this example here, and this is the Discoobulus. And this man was shown to be realistic but he's also sculpted in his ideal form. So we can see that he was sculpted to be very physically fit, looking very athletic and being the ideal male. So a lot of times, a lot of times we'll see these people being sculpted in a way to look ideal. Another things that the Greeks sculpted realistically were sculptures of the gods. And then these sculptures were placed in temples and shrines all throughout Greece as a way to honor them. And so Greeks would go to temples, for example, like the Temple of Zeus or the Temple of Athena. They would leave sacrifices and they would pray to the god standing before these wonderful sculptures that were designed. Also remember that these sculptures were often were also painted to look very realistic, even though over time the painting has worn away and they look just like white marble today. So the next thing you're going to do is with a partner, you are going to sculpt. You are going to attempt to sculpt in the best way possible our three orders or types of Greek columns, a Doric column with a simple capital or top, an Ionic column with a scroll at the top, and Corinthian columns last with our fancy leaves and scrolls. 
After you sculpt those, you are going to sculpt the disco bolus. And this is basically our ideal male throwing a discus. Once you sculpt these, you are going to take a picture for credit for this assignment. If you have any questions, please make sure to see your teacher. Good luck.